Bragg's Law is famous in crystallography as it is an elegant and simple understanding of how diffraction works. It uses the concept of planes, separated by a distance d interacting with x-rays of a wavelength, lambda. Diffraction occurs when the interplanar distance d is the same order as that of the wavelength of the x-rays. Here, using a little bit of Pythagoras, we show how the x-rays must travel 2d sine theta longer for the bottom plane than the first, for both to be in a diffracting position. This gives our famous law, n lambda equals 2d sine theta, where n must be an integer number, lambda the wavelength, and d our interplane spacing, and theta is the diffracting angle. In a diffraction experiment, what we measure on the detector is how the diffracted x-rays interfere with each other. Constructive interference leads to bright spots or reflections, whereas destructive interference does not. This gives us our diffraction pattern composed of a range of spots. The appearance of spots leads on quite nicely to show that we do not observe planes of diffraction, but spots, as diffraction is 3D. Bragg's law is a great representation of how diffraction works in 2D. However, we can make a better 3D model to represent diffracting conditions. This is the Ewald sphere, and we are going to discuss how it can be constructed, how to know our crystal is in a diffraction orientation, and what effect the wavelength has on our diffraction experiment. Paul Peter Ewald in the 1920s visualized the diffraction spots in 3D, much like this pudding. A slice of this pudding is like the 2D array of spots that we observe on the detector. Unlike a sphere in real space, where the origin is in the middle of the sphere, in reciprocal space, the origin is on the surface of the sphere. This is the point where the X-ray leaves the reciprocal space. Each spot on this Ewald sphere, which represents constructive interference of X-ray diffraction from atoms in real 3D space, can be assigned an index HKL. This is called a Miller index. And these values denote how far the spot is from the origin on the surface of the Ewald sphere along the reciprocal axis H, K and L. OK, let's simplify it for you. If we introduce some X-rays entering the crystal with a wavelength lambda, then in reciprocal space, the radius of sphere that the X-rays can see will be 1 over lambda. This is the reflecting sphere or the Ewald sphere. Let us now replace the crystal with layers of atoms. After all, that is what they are. The X-rays enter the reflecting sphere through the point Q and exit through O, which we know is the origin. While doing so, part of it gets diffracted by the atom at C and exit the sphere through a point P, highlighted here. The angle the diffracted beam CP makes with the lattice plane is theta. Now, if we draw some imaginary lines to connect point Q to P and O to P, we have a triangle. Basic geometry would tell us that angle PQO is also theta. Now for some basic trigonometry. Sine theta is the distance OP over OQ. We know that the radius of a reflecting sphere is 1 over lambda, which makes the distance OQ 2 over lambda while the distance between OP is 1 over D. That makes sine theta to be 1 over D over 2 over lambda, that is lambda over 2D. So, now we have defined Bragg's law again, using the concept of reciprocal space, not real space. Assume your crystal is a collection of atoms evenly spaced. The reflections from it would also be a collection of points in the reciprocal space. Let's draw an evolved sphere on it. The Ewald construction is really useful in understanding how to collect data and what reflections are accessible at that wavelength. If we rotate the reflecting sphere around point O, which is the same as rotating our crystal, we can draw another sphere. This second sphere is the limiting sphere. With a radius of 2 over lambda, any reflections beyond this sphere are not accessible with this wavelength. Let's try that again. Now watch what happens to the diffraction spots as we rotate the reflecting, or Ewald sphere, within the limiting sphere. Now let's see how we might access more reflections. If we move to a shorter wavelength of X-ray, our spheres will increase in radius, 
due to the reciprocal relationship between the radius of the spheres and the wavelength. This means in going from copper radiation, 1.54 angstroms, to molybdenum radiation, 0.71 angstroms, our sphere will double in size. We can highlight a lattice spot here so that you can observe the changes better. Of course, the inverse is true, where going to longer wavelengths will result in a smaller reflecting and limiting sphere of diffraction. Now let's see what will happen if we change the way atoms are arranged, or even simply just their orientation, like we would if we rotated the crystal. We harvest different reflections. We have now learnt how we can construct an eval sphere and saw how the choice of the X-ray wavelength and the orientation of the lattice planes can affect the reflections we can harvest. We also derived the Bragg's law from real space and reciprocal space. Now we know all of that, it is time to grow our own crystals. <laughs>